behold the Lamb of God who takes away our sin, who takes away our sin. The Holy Lamb of God makes us alive again, it makes us alive again. If you don't understand that, you can't behold the Lamb of God. Oh, He took away my sin. Oh, He took away my sin. Behold the Lamb of God makes us alive again. Makes us alive again. Oh, Your love, it was better for me. It's our victory. Yes, it is. God, we come to you this morning, God. We just thank you for the cross. Thank you for the victory we have in you, God. I pray you just open our hearts to receive the word that Chris has to bring, God. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. There we go. All right. Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Numbers, if you would, with me. Book of Numbers. We are in a series. Last week, we started a sermon series called Postmodern Wells. We introduced um, a third space or a postmodern well, the coffee house that we're going to be taking part in um, in times to come. They are in the process. Um, continue to pray for that team but they're in the process of putting all the nuts and bolts together, bells and whistles and all that. Um, they are actually already in the process of remodeling, and uh, so don't know when all that's going to happen, but as it comes or as we know, you will know. So we talked about third spaces, those, those things that are outside the church or things that are outside the home, things that we're, we rub shoulders with people we wouldn't normally have anything to do with, um, not because we didn't like them, maybe we didn't know them, we didn't have any reason to be in each other's circle. And then we found out at the end of the, uh, of the day, uh, Steve McElroy shared, it was because of a coffee house, the Lord got his attention and uh, he was saved because of that. And that is our prayer is that God would use these third spaces, these outside wells or postmodern wells in order to draw people to himself. So I don't know about you, at the end of the day today, we've got a, a We've got, a, we've got some work to do. So uh, I'm going to say this now, and uh, that way I won't have to make anybody feel bad at the end. If you have not signed up to build the Neighborhood of Hope, um, you're going to have the opportunity to do that at the end of the service. If you have no intention of uh, signing up and you said, I don't even like them houses, they're the ugliest color, or whatever, uh, then you're going to have an opportunity that you can be dismissed. But everybody that signed up and those that still need to sign up, we're going to have a meeting as soon as we can say amen because we've got to make sure you know who your team is and you've got to also make sure that you know uh, what the instructions are. Second thing I'll give you is this. If you sign up, you're going to get a call, and some of you already got it, may have already blocked it, but you're going to get a call, and it's going to say from Oklahoma City. Do not trash that call, all right? That's our, that's our calling post for me to you. Why in the world has got to go to Oklahoma City to come back to you? I don't know, but it does. So how many of you got that call yesterday and you trashed it? <laughs> I got you, right? So anyway, we've we got a lot to do at the end. You see the shirt. Everyone ever have the opportunity to buy these at the end and, um, and today and next week and getting ready for the build. Numbers uh, chapter 21 
And there's a lot that we're going to say up to that, so I want to get there in just a minute. But last week we started with modern, uh, the postmodern wells, and we're just starting a series, and it's entitled Well Dot Dot Dot. We don't have any other cute answer or any kind of title to give you. That's what it's called, all right? So somebody says, I don't get it. Well, I don't either. That's just what we came up with. But here's, the, here's what I want you to know, is that when Jesus was walking the earth, he didn't hang out in the synagogue, he didn't hang out in the temple, he went, but that ain't where he hung out. Most of the miracles were done at different places, such as the lake, places like funerals and weddings, people um, even in jails where God did great things. He said, I don't think I want to go there for God to move. Well, it could, and it's just the same today. If God were walking, if the Lord Jesus were walking here today, he wouldn't be hanging out probably in the service at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. While we're in here in our good air condition, our padded seats and our form of worship, he would probably be on that street out there finding somebody who needed a little bit of hope in their life. And I don't know about you, but there have been times that I've needed some hope and there's some people that are in my life that I know need some hope. If you got people like that in your life, say amen. There's places where God has spoken to me. These are just examples of third spaces or places where God speaks other than the church. One of them for me was at a Clemson ball game. Now, I'm not really, uh, wasn't a Clemson fan at that, at that time, although I, I liked their baseball program. We went to a game, and while I'm sitting there, some of you know this story, while I'm sitting there, the Lord speaks to my heart. It, was, it wasn't a field of dreams moment. I didn't hear a voice, but God laid on my heart, and all of a sudden, I felt the, I felt the Lord telling me, you'll be here one day. And I'm thinking, I'm going to Clemson? And I thought, I don't understand that. And we were talking about 12th man ministry and all different things. And I, I got really excited about that. I thought, yeah, we're going to take this ministry on the road. <laughs> and then the Lord, he kind of hit me with a right punch. And he says, but you've got a college right in your hometown and you've yet to minister to them. What makes you think you're ready for Clemson when you haven't even called Emmanuel? And that was several years ago when we started that process. That was on a Wednesday night. I was on vacation the next Sunday. I went back there that next Sunday to watch a game set in the very same seat. I'm sitting there, and it's like the Spirit of God spoke again and says, you'll be here one day. It was such a, it was such a thing to where I went to the, I had to go to the restroom just like, God, I don't understand this. It was kind of emotional. I didn't want to tell anybody because everybody thought I was an idiot. I didn't hear a voice. I just knew what God was speaking. How many of you know that the Bible says his sheep know his voice? And I knew when God was speaking to me. I remember where I was standing in station one, the fire department, when I went thinking I was just going to be a chaplain and pray. I remember where I was standing when the Lord spoke to me when Rusty King walked in the door. And I was putting on turnout gear that I didn't even know I was going to get that night. I was putting it on and the door opened up and he walked in and God said, that's why you're here. And it wasn't long after we take, passed our state test that I looked up and he walked this aisle, gave his life to Jesus. And I thought, that's why I'm there. There was a fire scene when a family was burned out and had nothing. That God said, you need more than just, they need more than just put out the fire. They need something extra. The end result of that, or one of the results we're on right now, we've taken trailers, we've done all kinds of things. Where we are right now is what this shirt represents for July 20th, 21st, and 22nd. And that is building homes where we can house people when they get burned out of their home. You know, uh, it was in the locker room this past year when they called me and said, we're not long, no longer going to, be a candidate for the hospital in, in Royston, giving it to somebody else. And within 48 hours, we had a new place. It was on a Tuesday night, July the 31st, 1984, when I was 19 years old. Metro Bible study, when a new group that had just started singing, entitled New Songs, sang a song, Good Old Boys Won't Make It Into Heaven. Good Old Boys Won't Wear a Crown. Good Old Boys Won't Live Forever Where the Saints of God Are Found. And I got to thinking about myself, and I said, you know what, I've never drank in my life. I'm a 21-year-old virgin. I was when I got married, so was my wife. I've never been high. I've never been drunk. And God said, yeah, but you're a good old boy, and you're going to split hell wide open if you don't get saved. God spoke to me, and I ride by that many times and see that place. I was laying in the hospital. The last thing I'll share with you, I was laying in the hospital. They had put a no, no visitor sign on my door. I had shut down from stress and all the stuff I was going through. I wanted to quit the ministry. And while I was laying there, I couldn't have visitors. I couldn't turn the lights on. And all I could do was lay in the bed and drink fluids. And that was before I came here. And while I was laying there, God said, I don't want you to be in the ministry that you're in anymore. It's time for you to pastor. And I could take you back to that same hallway and probably find that exact same room where I was lying there and God spoke to my heart. And I said, God, I've settled on the fact that I'm not going to be a pastor. He said, I've settled on the fact that you are. 
You find yourself arguing with God, I'm just going to tell you, save your breath, you're going to lose every time. There are places where God speaks to us. There are places where God just walks in. We may meet somebody. We may go to a place. We may do all these kind of things. And God speaks to us in some of the strangest places. If you would think if God's going to speak, he's going to speak at the synagogue or the temple in Jesus' day. But most of the time, he spoke at the lake. Most of the time, he spoke where the people were. Most of the time, he spoke where, where it wasn't just the church crowd. Can I tell you something? The church crowd has never done anything for God except crucify his son. So what happens? It starts in Numbers chapter 13. In Numbers chapter 13, here's the story. From chapter 13 all the way to chapter 21, we're going to end up at a well called Beer. It's not a place where they go and drink beer. It's just a place called Beer. And so we, at Numbers chapter 13, the children of Israel are standing, getting ready to cross over into what's the promised land. Moses as an instruction from God, takes the 12 spies. He sends them to Canaan. He said, I want you to go spy out the land. They go spy out the land. I want you to bring back some proof that it is truly flowing with milk and honey. I want you to prove to these people that it's there. The Bible says they went. They did that. They went to a valley called Eshcol. They cut down a group of grapes. They put it between a pole, I mean a huge bunch of grapes, and they carried it back to the people of Israel. And when they got there, there was no doubt God was in this. There was no doubt that it was truly, truly flowing with milk and honey. There was no doubt that it was plentiful. There was no doubt that there was fertile soil. There was no doubt that what God said was going to happen. But there was one verse that changed the entire position of the children of Israel. And it's in Numbers chapter 13, verse 28, and it's the first word of the verse, and it's the word nevertheless. They said, we can take it. It truly is flowing with milk and honey. Nevertheless, there are giants in the land. And I want you to know something. As much as God wants to use you, Satan has some giants he wants to put in front of you. It could be any kind of giant you want to name. It could be your health. It could be your finances. It could be your talent. It could be your lack of talent. But Satan has giants to put in every position, in every lane that you're in. Going forward with God, Satan has some giants. How many of you know what some of your giants are? Raise your hand. You know what they are. I know that I have some and you have some. So in chapter 13, they didn't believe God. They believed that it was plentiful, but they didn't want to believe God enough to face the giants. Here's where we have a lot of people today in the church. A lot of people say, you know what? I want to do something big for God, but I'm not willing to fight to do it. And so many people are sitting on the couch today because they weren't willing to go forward to do what God wanted them to do. And so here we have in chapter 13, Jesus, uh, I mean, God says, hey, listen, how long have I got to deal with this, this, this vile congregation? And in chapter 14, he sends them back to the wilderness for 40 years. And here's what he tells them. Nobody will ever see the promised land of this generation that's of this generation, meaning of age, except for Joshua and Caleb. They're the only ones that are going to go. And so for 40 years, they take off on a journey. They're going nowhere. They know that the promised land that they've been promised is no longer theirs because of disobedience. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. I believe there are many churches today that have had the promise of God. God's given them favor. He's given them a time. But because they didn't believe God enough to walk behind God, somebody else got their blessing. Somebody else got their dream. I believe that every one of us, if the scripture's true, I believe every one of us get an opportunity to do something big for God. It's what we do with that opportunity that counts. So what do we do on a 40-year journey? 40 years they travel in the wilderness. So I want to ask you, I want to give you seven things. What do we do when we're on a journey in the wilderness? I have a question for you. Raise your hand if you've ever been in the wilderness as a Christian. Holy cow, yeah. If you haven't, get ready. You're headed there. Just to encourage you. <laughs> But there's several things that we do. First of all, what do we do? They complained. The whole story started out. They didn't believe God, and God sent them away from the Jordan back for 40 years. And guess what? One thing after another, every time they didn't get what they wanted, they would whine and complain against Moses and against Aaron. Whine and complain. It's kind of like us right now with this raining. I've done more whining about the rain than I ever did praying for God to send us some rain. God, we got slabs to pour. God, we got houses to build. I want to say, I know I didn't hear God's voice, but I know he's probably thinking, you don't think I know that? 
I got this. So what, Chris, what are we going to do if we show up on the day of and it's underwater? We're going to build a floating slab. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to trust God. That's all I know. Mm. But it sounds like a bunch of us today, we the church, we, we don't get what we want and they begin to complain about or to the preacher about themselves or about something that's going on and we wonder why the power of God's not in the church it's because we got people that can't even get on the same page with God. Numbers chapter 13, he sent them out, he sent them away. Numbers 14, 40 years, they're in the wilderness. But Numbers chapter 20, they were journeying through the wilderness <laughs> and guess what they didn't have? They didn't have water. I don't know if you know this or not, but water is essential for life. I got a question for you. If water is essential for life and God's the giver of life and God gave you your breath and God gave you everything you got, don't you think that God knows how much water we need? Don't you think that God knows the rain that we need? See, we got builders over here saying, God, we need a dry day. We got farmers saying, Lord, bring it on. Well, say, whoever's closest to God, that's not true. See, prayer does not move God. Prayer moves as us. We don't, we don't pray and say, God, I prayed it down today. I got God to listen to me. Oh, no. What happened is you prayed and you got in where God says, okay, oh, now you're in line. Prayer doesn't move God as much as prayer moves us. Numbers chapter 20, they're journeying through the wilderness and they have no water. Look at, look at chapter 20, verse 2. They gathered together against Moses. Now, Moses is just the leader, but listen to me. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Moses out there doing everything he can do. He's leading them. Hey, he knows they're a bunch of whiny pots. He knows that. And he's leading them, and all of a sudden, they get, the Bible says they get together against Moses. And look what they said in verse 5. Why did you bring us out of Egypt where there was no food and there was no water? Are you kidding me, Moses? Why did you do this to us? You know, He said, we have no water, and the only food we got is that old bread that none of us like. The old tasteless bread, the old manna. It wasn't the fact that God supplied their need for 40 years. It was the fact that they wanted something more than their need. Somebody said, well, I tell you what, I'm praying for God to do this and that. God said he would supply your need. He didn't say anything about your wants. And they get their wishes not granted. Here's what I've seen. They go to the Red Sea, boy, they got a high time. They get on the other side, they go to a place called Mar, they got no water, bitter water, and they complain. God gives them water, it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Does that sound like anybody you know? Does it sound like us? It sounds like me. Here's the second thing we do. We say things like this. It was easier for me to live for God when I wasn't saved. You ever seen, you ever thought that? I tell you what, I was doing a whole lot better before I got saved. Now it seems like it's a struggle every day. How many have ever said that? Yeah, I've said it. Here's something else I say. If I had money, I had money before I started tithing. Stop, see how much you got. You know, I, I'll get saved, but don't ask me to quit drinking my beer, dipping my snuff, or missing the lake for church. I didn't sign up for all that. You know, I've often said, I hope that the, when the Lord comes back, he don't come back on Georgia, Florida weekend or a sunny day when it's better to be at the lake than it is at church. And I know I ain't getting no help this morning. I get that. But I'm telling you. Somebody said, I thought I was going to be blessed. They start complaining before you know it. You're out of church, back in the same lifestyle that they were in, all because they didn't get their way. And guess what? It's not their fault because after all, it's just not their fault. Um, you know, we've had people with spectacles at this church and they, they get sideways because somebody didn't stroke them or somebody didn't pet them. Are y'all right this morning? Y'all quiet as all get out this morning. I'll go in that room preach if I have to and y'all just have to leave or stay. I don't know. But I know this. They get on Facebook and they throw some message out there and it gets people to feel sorry for them and you don't know the really the behind the scenes of what's really going on. You just see what you see on Facebook and then you make a decision about what truth is based on some disgruntled whiny hiney that's on Facebook that wouldn't know God if you hemmed him up in this room right here. And we wonder, where's God? Why doesn't God bless my life? Why doesn't God do something big for me? Why doesn't God pour it out on me? I'm telling you why. Because he knows he can't trust you with the blessings he's already given you. 
Here's the third one. We can either do it God's way or we can do it our way. I want you to look at chapter 20. Take your Bible, look at chapter 20. I just want you to see this. He says, just look at verse 5 there. It's on the screen. And why have you made us come up from Egypt to bring us to this evil place? Is it not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates? Nor is there any water to drink? I mean, these people just whining, complaining about everything. Then all of a sudden, they come up on this rock. And God tells Moses, he said, take that stick you got in your hand. And he didn't say anything about smacking the rock. He said, take that stick and speak to the rock. What did Moses do? Moses took that stick, whacked that rock twice, and, and, and water came out. See, here's the thing. We can do it God's way or we can do it our way. You may get, listen, you may get the same visual results. If they'd have spoke to the rock, water would have come out. God said it. But since they hit the rock, water still came out. So what's the problem? The problem is we, we mistake sometimes the results as obedience. We mistake the, the, we mistake the results of what we see, what everybody's patting us on the back about, said, oh man, they got some results. It must be God. Results do not equal fellowship and God. Results may be something that could be false. Sometimes we got our eyes on, oh, God's blessing it, so it must be God. Instead of speaking to the rock in verse 11, he struck the rock twice with the rod, then water came out abundantly, and the people and their animals drank. It was probably a little better if he said, you know what, if I go down and hang out with the boys, I can say I had a piece of that. I had a part in that. If I just spoke to it, nobody even, you know, nobody may even know that I was a part of that. But I got this stick. They say, hey, is that that stick you hit that rock with? Yes, sir, buddy. You like that stick? I whacked that rock, son. Water come out of that thing. Results. Here's the fourth thing. During a time like this, people are looking for an answer. People are asking God, God, would you show up? God, would you pour it out on me? And here's your fourth point. Many mistake false blessing for obedience. Think about it. I want to start this business. Oh, God's doing this, this, this. I don't really feel a peace about it, but God's blessing it. Many mistake false blessing for obedience. All of a sudden, their prayers had been answered. But just because we have results doesn't mean that it's God. See, we are in a result-based society, and when we see them, then we automatically think it's a sign of success. I'll be honest with you. There are a lot of churches. Don't ever hear me think, oh, I'm against them big churches. I'm not. But there are a lot of churches that mistake the size of their church for God's favor. You have 12,000 people not have God's favor. Just because you got a big edifice and you got a big building doesn't mean anything. I tell you what better happen. We better have people who are following the lordship of the Holy Spirit. That's what, we ought, that's what ought to happen right there. In, chapter, in that same chapter, verse 12, what happened? Because you didn't do it my way, then you will not enter the land that I prepared for you. Now, it's fixing to get to a time where you get to remembering. As they journeyed on, they'd come to a piece of land at times, and they said, can we cross over? We won't even drink your water. We won't eat your crops. The children of Israel, can we just cross over to get over there? And every landowner said, no, not today. See, they're looking for a favor, looking for somebody to give them an out, somebody to say, hey, listen, let's forget all the stuff we've not done or that we have done. Just let us cross over. We'll start better over there. And every one of them, God shut the door on every one of them. See, God's going to allow you to go for a time. God's going to allow you to get to a point. And then he's going to say, as far as you're going, The length of your journey is based on your character. Well, I want God to bless me. I want God to take me somewhere. I want God to use me in a big way. Here's what I do know. If you don't have the character to carry through what you want God to do in your life, you're going to go a piece. He's going to let you think you're a big shot. And I'm going to tell you what, he's going to shut it down. And you're going to be standing there thinking, what happened? What in the world? Where did God go? Here's a fifth thing. There are many that forget where they came from. You ever met somebody and said, boy, I tell you what, when I get this and I get that, I'm going to do this. Then they get this and get that and they don't do this. 
because we forgot where we came from. We forgot that we were on our face begging for God to give us a job. Then God gave us a job and then we lay out of work. We forgot that we were praying for God to give us a vehicle. He gave us two. We built a new house. Now we can't use one of those vehicles to be at the house of God. We forget where we come from. Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 and 6. I want you to look at it. In chapter, chapter 21, verse 4, as they journeyed, they went by the Red Sea. The soul of the people became very discouraged. Why? All of a sudden, they were faced with the reality of not believing God. They're in a journey, 40 years, and they, all of a sudden, they turn the corner, maybe, and they get to the place called the Red Sea, and it was the last place to where they did things the way God wanted them done. And all of a sudden, they remember. Wow, y'all, y'all remember what happened last time we was here? We saw God show out. We saw God do something that we never thought he would do. We, we never thought that would happen. And the Bible says, he says, as they journeyed, the people became very discouraged. God allowed them to see where it all started. Just think about it. They journeyed to the Red Sea, and they had deliverance through the Red Sea. They journeyed to the Jordan River, but they had the rejection from the Promised Land. And for 40 years, they go through the wilderness. But look at verse 5 of chapter 21. Verse 5, there was now no more Aaron to complain to. Aaron had died. So who'd they complain to? They complained to Moses and God. See, they went to Aaron and Moses, God's men first. But now Aaron's out of the way, he's passed away, and now they're complaining to God and Moses. Here's what they just did. They've just crossed the line. It's not the fact that I'm just not happy with this. They, they had enough boldness to go to God and say, God, I don't like what you've done. I don't like anything you're doing here. Number six is people seem to, multi- seem to have problems that multiply on top of each other. Look at Numbers 21. Verse six is God sent fiery serpents and many of the people who were killed by the snakes. I thought most people knew this, maybe because I knew it and I, had, I learned it several years ago. How many of you have ever been to the doctor's office and you see, you see a pole and it has a snakes that are wrapped around like this at the very top? How many of you have ever seen that? Whether you've seen it or whether you may know what it is or whatever, it comes from this scripture right here. Back in the day when they were running from God and when they were being disobedient to God, God got so mad, he sent fiery serpents. And the Bible says that many of the Israelites were bitten, and when they were bitten, many of them died. And Aaron, I mean, and and Moses went and cried out to God again, God, you've got to fix this. All of a sudden, God says, take a pole, put a bronze serpent on it. And he said, whoever gets bit by the snake, if they'll look up at that serpent or they'll look up at that pole, They will not die. And that's where that comes from. What's the point of this story? Is that many times when we're away from God, many times when things are not going our way, problems seem to multiply on top of each other. First of all, they didn't have water. Next of all, they didn't have what they liked. Next of all, they're getting bit by snakes. And everything they're doing is turning upside down on top of them. Listen to me. I don't know who I'm speaking to today, but I can tell you this. With a crowd this size, and even in my own life, I know this. There are some things that you've gotten involved in. And it looked real good in the beginning. But as you've traveled, it feels like the world's turned over on top of you. And I'm going to tell you something. Here's what he's saying. That pole is a picture of the cross. And he says, when you look to the cross, hey, listen, trouble's going to be there. Trouble doesn't keep, I mean, Christ doesn't keep us from trouble, but Christ is there when we go through trouble. He says, if you look up at the pole... You will not die. Listen, can I tell you something? In your worst day, in your worst day, God's there to take care of you. In your worst day, in your worst day of disobedience, his love for you has never changed. In your worst day when you feel worthless, because I'm telling you, there are some days when I as a Christian think, man, I tell you what, if my salvation is based on my performance, I'm probably not going to make it. I'm just thankful it's not based on my performance. It's based on God's provision. Amen? The last point is this. Numbers chapter 21, verse 16, they come to a place called Beer. For there they went to Beer, which is the well, where the Lord said to Moses, gather the people together and I will give them water. We talked last week about a third space or a postmodern well as a neutral place where people can come. 
Today, I want you to understand this. A well is a place where God speaks to you. And I want to ask you a question. How many can go back to a spot where God spoke to you and you know it was God? You know, man, this is where it all started. I was sitting in over here in my bass boat and God spoke. I was sitting on the lawnmower and God spoke. I was watching TV and God spoke. I was in the shower and God spoke. Whatever the case. But I know that's where God spoke to my life. They journeyed from there and came to beer. Look at verse 16. The well the Lord had spoke to Mo- said to Moses, gather the people together and I will give them water. See, when water came out of the rock, it was for an immediate relief. But when they dug a well, it was for a, uh, for an, to uncover a supply that was for long term. Listen to me. God does not just want to fix your problem immediately. God wants to develop a relationship with you now that's going to last the rest of your life. He doesn't want to give you just a drink. He wants to dig a well. He doesn't want to just give you, hey, I'm hot right now. I need something to drink. He doesn't want to just give you a drink of water. He wants to give you a well to where water will always be because the rest of your life you're going to have a need for God to come through when you're dry. I don't know who you are, but I know in my own life there have been a lot of times when I've been dry as a Christian. A lot of times I'm thinking, God, I don't know where you're at. But the Bible says they begin to dig a well in the middle of the desert, and as they dug, they tapped into a spring of water. You know what? They had no idea it was there. Guess what started happening? They began to worship. And as they worship, God began to give them water. I heard Bill Stafford say this statement years ago. He said, sometimes you got to act as if it is so when it's not so, so that God can make it so. Sometimes we got to step out on faith. We're saying, God, if you'll give us a blueprint of what it's going to look like, then God, I'll follow you. God said, no, if you'll step out with a blank sheet of paper and sign it, then I'll give you the instructions as you go. Every one of our builders last night getting ready for that build in July, every one of them got house plans. Every one of them is putting materialists together. Every one of them is doing all that work. And that's all good because we got to have it for that weekend. But when you start following Christ, you get a blank sheet of paper. And all he wants you to do is sign it. Wait a minute, I don't want to sign. I don't know, what is, I don't know what's involved in this. That's how you trust him. Walking with Christ, he's in charge. Here's what I do know. There may be a whale running underneath your, underneath your um, feet right now, and you don't even know it. And here me tell you what God wants you to do. God wants you to dig a whale. God wants you to come to the altar where, where he's there. See, the well at Beer, it was a place where God spoke to Moses. This morning, you may have come because you're just a friend or a family or whatever. Come on up here, man. You, 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 got, you may have just came for whatever reason. But sitting through the music, the Spirit of God began to deal with you last night. And all of a sudden, things are beginning to change. It's like, man, why do I feel like this? Because maybe there is a well, a spring running underneath your feet. And God says, hey, I want you to stop in your tracks. I want you to start digging. Because of the, what you're longing for, what you're needing, is right here. But I want you to dig when there's nothing to be seen. I want you to dig in the ground to where... Hey, it's got to be me. So you got to remember, they were in the desert. They were in a place where there was no water. They were in a place where it didn't make sense to dig. And, but God spoke to Moses and tell them to say, hey, start digging right here. Start digging right here. Because when you dig right here, you can't see it right now. But if you'll start digging, I'll guarantee you, there's water below your feet. The things that you're longing for, the dryness in your life. There's people that are going to cross your path that don't even know they need God to do a work in their life until they cross your path. And because of the Spirit of God in your life, they're going to think, man, I'll tell you what, I want some of what they've got. There have been places in my life where God spoke to me. And there have been times in my life when I've been sitting here in church, either preaching. There have been times while I'm preaching, God spoke to my heart and said, you need to listen to your own sermon. You ever had that happen, John? Yeah, it's always best if you do that before, but it's happened during. Ever happened to you? Be in the middle of preaching, thing. I'm getting them now. And God said, yeah, you ain't got it yet. But there have been times, listen to me, there have been times in my Christian life, there have been times when I have walked with God and it was as clear as a bell that the presence of God was on my life. There have been those times. 
And there have been some times when I'm thinking, God, I don't know where you went. I don't feel you. I don't sense you. I don't know where you're at. And sometimes it's not a magical, it's never a magical. But sometimes God just will remind me of something. He may remind me of a verse I read. He might remind me of a song. He might remind me of a person that's blessed my life. Just to encourage me. David sings a song about coming to the altar. I want you to sing it, David. But what I do know is this. An altar is more than just a place. Altar is more than just a just in front of the church. An altar is where you meet with God. An altar is where God speaks to your heart and you start digging. <laughs> Everything's good. Everything's fine. And also, why do I feel like this? Maybe you got a need in your life that nobody knows about. Can I tell you what you need to do? Nobody can thirst. Nobody can quench your thirst, but the Lord Jesus. He's the only one can. You sit here Sunday after Sunday. You hear scripture after scripture, and you trust, and you think, God, I know I need that. And you know what? Nobody has to tell you what you need because you know. Nobody has to tell you, Hey, listen, you're lost or saved. You already know that. It's not that you don't know what to do, it's the fact of stepping forward and doing it. So I want to ask you if you'd stand to your feet. I just want to sing this song. I may even stop them in the middle of it, I don't know. But I want you to listen to the words of it. If God speaks to your heart, I want you to respond to what he says, not what I say. But some of you may need to come to the altar. Some of you may need God to do a work in your life. Some of you may need a touch or a healing. Some of you may need to get saved. Whatever the Lord is telling you, you come as they sing. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to just bow your head right where you are. I don't know your need this morning. I really don't. I know there are some. But I'm going to tell you something. Don't put off for tomorrow what God's telling you to do today. And if he's speaking to your heart, do what he says. If he's sitting there and says, man, today is your day. You need to get saved today. Listen, there's only two kinds of people in this church, those who are saved and those who need to be. You may be sitting there and say, Chris, I'm saved, but I'm dry. 
Man, I'm telling you, there's a well for you to drink from. There's a well for you to drink from. Maybe you're here and you say, tell you what, I don't even know what I need. I just need prayer. Whatever your need is, hey, listen, it's just common folks around here that are just trying to get right with God. Let me encourage you, obey God. regrets and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling so come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So come to the altar, the Father's arms are open Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought. was baptized this morning. I don't know if you could see him, maybe this part of his head, but he was saved several weeks ago. And then his mama, Tracy, and they're coming this morning. Grandma and them's back there, and I know they're proud. They're coming this morning to uh, join our fellowship. He got baptized, we're going to join, and she said, you know what, I don't think I've ever joined. So uh, we're just going to settle that deal right now. So if you're glad to have them, would you give the Lord a great hand? This is Susan Lindsley. Susan, her first day here was uh, when we introduced a year ago, we were going to do a coffee shop. And then when we introduced her to the way she, I looked at her, she looked at me, I said, yep, you, you heard that, didn't you? So uh, God, listen, whatever you're going to do, God's going to send the people you need to do it. Amen. So uh, Susan's coming this morning, joining our church. You rejoice with her. Would you give the Lord a great hand? Thank Please. you. Amen. 
I'm going to ask you guys to be seated right there just for a moment. Uh, as soon as we dismiss here in a minute, we're going to, uh, we're going to have a time of fellowship and come by and shake their hands, whatever. I'm going to ask everyone to be seated just for a moment. I want to thank also, I want to thank Renovate for being here. If you're thankful for these guys, would you let them know it? And we'll be seeing more of them. They practice here once a month.